Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. What's your favorite soul food? Sweet potato pie, fried chicken, collard greens, dumplings? With the holidays approaching, tis the season to chow down on some serious comfort food. But what about the fat, the calories, the sugar, the salt? If you're watching what you eat, does that mean soul food is off the menu? Up next on this pledge edition of Another View, Chef Wilbert Jones joins us to swap healthy food, healthy soul food recipes. But first, today is the last day of our radio fundraiser, and it's your turn, Another View listeners, to show your love for our show. Sandra Woodward and Dan Cauley are in Pledge Central with an update. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Let me start by saying thank you to those of you who have already made your pledge of support to WHRV-FM and to Another View. We could not bring you this show without your help, and we appreciate you as a listener and as a member. Now, one of our generous donors who asked to remain anonymous has decided to match your pledge of support dollar for dollar up to $2,000. This match is specifically in support of another view and I know we can reach this goal and go over it I know that just dial 889-9476 and tell the volunteer that you're calling in support of another view Lisa Victor and I along with the rest of the another view staff we sure thank you for your support don't we Keith Dr. Keith Newby who is a doctor who is uh, here with us today and Keith can you hear us Yes. Yeah, yeah, there, there you, you are. Go. Okay. okay. Right. <laughs> yes, I did hear you, Barbara. <laughs> Dr. Keith Newby, who is always with us on the fourth Friday when we talk about another view on health. And Dr. Newby has just told me he's going to do what about matching towards that $2,000 yeah, plan? Yeah, I'm going to match because uh, Barbara's already beat me up in here. <laughs> 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 so I am planning on matching something, and we will uh, talk <laughs> off the air about what that will be, but I will make sure it's a generous donation. Fantastic. Thank you so much and we hope that the rest of you will join us too now we're going to talk today about cooking healthy soul food i know it sounds like an oxymoron but (laughs) believe me it really can happen in just a few minutes but first let me welcome to another view miss frida bryant with the american cancer society who is here to tell us about a brand new study that has to do with um eating and cancer hi frida how are you I'm well, Barbara. How are you? And hello, Dr. Newby. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm well. Okay, well. so Frida, you, there's a new study out, and it's it's some good news if we pay attention to our diet. It is. We released the findings of a 32-year study. It was our cancer prevention study number two. And um, we followed 1.2 million people. But this one specifically, when it talks about lowering the risk of breast cancer, um, looked at 73,000 postmenopausal women and found one of the uh, five findings that we found was walking helps women lower their risk of breast cancer. And also losing weight and keeping it off could reduce the breast cancer risk. And gaining weight significantly increases the likelihood of developing breast cancer. Wow. Um, and the study had shown that those who put on 60 or more pounds after the age of 18 doubled their risk of postmenopausal breast cancer diagnosis. And then the other two, um, one that we know, of course, smoking may increase the risk. And then we were also able to understand the common genetic variations um, to predict breast cancer risk. So it goes right in line with the show that you have today, Barbara, and, and happy <laughs> Pledge Friday um, in reference to our healthy lifestyles, and, and which includes, of course, activity. But we know that obesity is the new tobacco. And if we don't take control of that and take charge of our health and, of course, get our screenings that we should at the appropriate age, that um, we're not doing our, ourselves justice. But uh, that was from the cancer prevention study number two. That wow. We did. That's some incredible news. And it's not something we've always known. Dr. Newby, obesity crosses all kinds of diseases. It's a cause of all kinds of diseases. Yeah, multiple multiple lines of uh, problems I found with um, you know diabetes we talked about before, heart disease. So it really doesn't surprise me to hear this about the cancer risk. I think just the 
obesity itself just creates so many other health conditions that, uh, you know, I, I, I think the data is pretty clear now, so we can't refute any of that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, Frida, you also want to remind us about that also important appointment we need to be making. Yes, we do know that early detection saves lives and part of those screenings, and of course this month with being National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, is that mammogram. Um, The guidelines state that starting at age 40 when you're at low risk, women should start getting their mammograms. If you're at a higher risk, then have that conversation with your doctor and you may uh, decide to have that uh, screening earlier, but the uh, mammogram is our a digital mammogram is a standard right now that we're using, but there also is uh, a 3D mammogram. So uh, women, please, please, if you haven't made that appointment yet, please do so. The 3D mammogram is available uh, in the Hampton Roads area through multiple systems, Mm -hmm. but it's especially important for women who may have dense breasts. And um, cancer shows up as white on a mammogram, and um, dense breasts show up as white on a mammogram. So Mm -hmm. it's like trying to find a polar bear in a snowstorm, if you would. So we all do know that the earlier the cancer is detected, then better the outcome. So for those of you who have not scheduled that appointment yet, please do so. We do recommend that every 12 months. And again, starting at the age of 40, or if you're in a higher risk category, um, then please have that conversation with your doctor and you may need that screening a little bit more, a little bit earlier. Frida, give us a number, especially if someone may have problems um, or need assistance with paying for that mammogram. What number can they call with the uh, um, Cancer Society? Yes, our 800 number is 1-800-ACS, which is 227-2345. Again, that's 1-800-227-2345. And every state has a program called Breast and Cervical Early Detection. They offer free mammograms and pap smears to women who qualify, whether it's in the income range or the um, household or age range. And here in the state of Virginia, our program is called Every Woman's Life. Okay. All right. Frida Bryan with the American Cancer Society. Frida, thank you so much for joining us. We really oh, thank appreciate you, Barbara. it. You have a wonderful, blessed weekend okay. and happy Pledge Friday. Thank you so much. We okay. appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, that probably wasn't a good idea to do that right before the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> People may get mad at us. I know, exactly. <laughs> now, the holidays are coming, and that means means lots of gatherings centered around food. And today we're talking specifically about soul food. You know what it is, and you know that it usually is laden with fat, sugar, and salt, because after all, that's what makes it taste so good. But is it good for our heart, not to mention our waistline? Joining us to talk about how to make soul food taste good is Chef Wilbert Jones. He is a cookbook author, food product developer, and host of the PBS Culinary series, Health Heritage Kitchen. Chef Jones, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Welcome to Another View, and thanks so much. So, well, thank you. this whole idea of soul food and healthy, can they really come together? Absolutely. They can come together. When you look at food in any traditional form, whether if it's Italian or French, there's always extreme ends, meaning unhealthy, or you can just kind of dial it back and make it healthy by the ingredients and, of course, the portion sizes that you're using. Mm -hmm. So what is it then? First of all, how do you define soul food? Well, soul food, basically, when you really look at it, the term came in the 1960s when African Americans were really trying to identify with um, so-called a lost culture, you know, with slavery, et cetera. Um, So you had the music. um, You also had the food that they really were connecting to. But the cuisine itself goes all the way back to slavery. Mm -hmm. Um, It was not just slaves eating, um, as they always used to say, discarded food in the South. It's also well, poor whites eating that same kind of food, because all whites in the South did not own slaves. So the, the, the identification of the term was really in a, a 1960s term, so it's you know, not, not that old. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the food itself, uh, at least a couple hundred years. Mm-hmm. And so are, are, there, are there certain ingredients that are common in most soul food dishes that are not good for us? 
Well, uh, we, you know, over the decades have learned what good, what isn't. Um, you know, I always believe in moderation, you know, not really taking out anything, but eating it in moderation. But all of us can't do that because when you think of food, you um, it, food is like emotional eating. When you mentioned earlier the intro with the holiday, mm-hmm. of course, there's certain dishes that have to be on the African-American table or any table <laughs> of, a, of a race, uh, or it just wouldn't be Thanksgiving or it wouldn't be Christmas if it's someone that make a good cobbler, et cetera. But it goes back to ingredients and the portion sizes that I think that really makes the difference here. Um, I don't like to say, you know, this ingredient is not good because anything could not be good for you if you overeat. Um, there's certain things we've outruled already, you know, in terms of using lard, of course, of turn of using a lot of pork pieces, substituting it with uh, smoked turkey or perhaps maybe going through a vegan version by seasoning the product up through herbs and spices. Uh, but once again, um, I think that moderation is key unless there are some serious health issues that the person is currently dealing with that, of course, they have to extremely dial it back. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, Chef, since you cook for a lot of people and, and you know what tastes good and so forth, if you're having a, um, a holiday dinner, say a Thanksgiving dinner, then you know most people are very traditional. And so you put this plate of collard greens on the table and there's no meat in it and it's and you try to convince everybody that it's going to taste great because it's got all these herbs and stuff how do you get people's palate to accept a different taste well one way you know food once again is so emotional uh it's also a link with psychology too um you know my reference of of what i normally do if i'm trying a healthy dish or, or trying something unique that a person if you tell them what's in it they would just totally reject it uh, I would reference was like, well, you know, such and such have had this dish before and, you know, went over well or I like it. Um, you go on that route um, and you say, well, you know, can you believe that this is actually almost fat free tasted? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and from a health angle, um, you, you try to pull it that way. <laughs> okay, if you say mm-hmm. so, uh, I want to invite our <laughs> invite our audience. You know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I want to invite our audience to join us. And if you call into the show to talk about healthy soul food, you are not required to pledge. We would love it if you do, but you're not required to pledge. So join our conversation here four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call. Let's talk about what you're doing to make your soul food dishes healthy. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Okay, let's take a um, a dish. Let's talk about collard greens. How do you Mm -hmm. make them healthy? Well, uh, let, let's go back. It, it, there's different ways you can look at it. Do you want a vegan, vegetarian version, or you can also have lean meat pieces in it, such mm-hmm. as a piece of, um, you know, smoked meat. Uh, again, not letting it dominate the dish, um, perhaps just a part of a turkey, but perhaps you can um, take your shears, you can cut the outer layer of the fat off of the turkey itself. What I like to do, as opposed to boiling all the flavor out of it, is sometimes just taking <laughs> something like a cube smoked drumstick and uh, I'm sorry, taking a drumstick and actually cubing it up and cutting it into small uh, pieces um, and, you know, searing it just in a little bit of olive oil or a nonstick cooking spray. And then mm-hmm. three-fourths of the way when the greens are being cooked, um, as we call naked, or perhaps maybe with some onions and garlic, um, is that you put these nice little cubes of um, um, smoked turkey um, over into the dish itself. So you're basically mm-hmm. getting the essence as if you're eating some smoked pork. Mm-hmm. And you put that in about halfway through the cooking of the greens themselves? I would themselves? say about maybe halfway through because it doesn't, you're you already kind of searing it on the stove um, and they're cut up in cubes. And so you're just taking a traditional smoke drawn stick, cutting the skin off of it and uh, taking your knife and, um, you know, just running some nice cubes or some nice slices in it and uh, searing it as if you're seeing a piece of meat, rendering it off, um, you know, if it's just an olive oil, mm-hmm. uh, nonstick cooking spray, there's nothing to render off. And then you just, you know, fold that over into your dish. Mm-hmm. Is olive oil? Well, something that you use a lot in in cooking I soul food. I use it. Um, well, you know, it's a, it's good for the body, but at the same time, you know, if you're watching your waistline, it's still you know, it's a good fat, but it's still calorie driven. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's a good substitute for a lot of the oils out here. Um, you know, of course, the canola is good for you as well. Only six percent saturated fat. Um, so it it you know it if you can cook a lot of dishes, you know, there's a lot of uh, nonstick cookware. Uh, sometimes you just have to, you know, maybe just do just a quick little spray of nonstick 
plastic uh, cooking spray, and then you can go that route. You don't always have to, you know, add the olive oil in it, but I just like to, to render off the meat itself um, mm-hmm. as opposed to the meat just hitting the nonstick cooking spray because you have to know what you're doing with the nonstick cooking spray because it burns quite quick. Mm-hmm. I have, I have We've all seen that before. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a question. You know, I have to ask this because, uh, you know, it's, it's like people with uh, macaroni and cheese. You know, you have everybody says everybody cannot cook this properly. So I'm going to ask the same thing about cornbread, which, uh, you know, in terms of how, because I've heard people describe, you know, as a, I've, I've seen people cook it drier. I've seen people cook it almost, and in, in, in some chefs I know don't even like to cook it like you know corn cake, which is they call it <laughs> in in this uh, not so nice fashion. But your particular uh, viewpoint on cornbread, how do how do you prepare that? Just out of curiosity. Well, I'm a southerner, but I've been in Chicago for 40 years. I don't like a sweet cornbread. Okay. You know, the us in the deep south, we don't like sweet cornbread. Or that's more of a northern <laughs> My kind husband of thing. agrees People with like you 100 cornbread. You know, the whole, um, I won't mention any brands on the air, um, but I like a non-sweet cornbread. So off the back, you got to distinguish what the ingredients you're using. Uh-huh. But I'll just go with what's popular during the holiday, which is the typical sweet cornbread. Uh-huh. A lot of things that you can do. People mistake in buttermilk as being like a fatty kind of a milk. You can uh-huh. go that route and using buttermilk, you get the texture there, and also you get a little bit of that flavor in the background. Or, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, an abundance of eggs, you know, if you traditionally use three or four eggs in your recipe, you know, uh, one whole egg equal to two egg whites, you can go egg white root, uh, along with uh, perhaps maybe a little bit of sour cream or reduced fat sour cream. Because what you're really trying to do, you're trying to get the moisture into the product, meaning the cornbread, mm-hmm. um, and you're trying to get a little bit of the flavor as well. Um, a flavor that won't won't dominate the taste of the cornbread once it's you know cooked where you actually taste in that cornbread taste mm-hmm. okay, that, yeah that's a that's a key thing because there's nothing worse than eating some cornbread feel like you're in the sahara desert <laughs> give you something to drink behind this oh in terms of being uh, <laughs> oh, uh, dry uh, as a bone of yeah. <laughs> in my very very first uh cookbook written 18 years ago i did uh, almost essentially fat-free cornbread, and I, you know, spiced it up with some jalapeno peppers and stuff like that, you know, just try to camouflage it because it essentially had just zero, no fat in it almost. No you know? fat and, at all. And, and, and yeah, and so people, do you, you know, know that's can such you tell a, us a what... drastic move for them to go from, you know, something that tastes like cake and, and, and calories of cake to almost nothing. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us the exact recipe for that with no fat? I'm just curious um, as to how sure, that came together. Absolutely. Let me, um, I, I pulled my book out in front, uh, my old book, my very first book, um, and let me just um, go over to it. Um, the, uh, it's Let's flip through here. Yeah, so that was like one of them. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it's basically some jalapeno cornbread. So what you'd be looking at would be uh, like a couple of cups of uh, the yellow cornmeal and then flour, uh, which is one cup. So the ratio is two to one. And then Mm -hmm. some baking powder for leavening. And then just a little bit of sugar because I knew I wouldn't be able to get away with just making (laughs) the kind of cornbread I like. Mm -hmm. Um, And then this here is a dated book and uh, 18 years ago written. So I went with the skim route. uh, So I used a cup of skim milk, but for... Uh, more um, liquid to make the the bread more palatable. I use six egg whites. So okay. once again, getting rid of that yolk because one yolk of you know egg is two hundred and twenty five milligrams of cholesterol. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you can get the same volume if you use two egg whites for one egg. And when you and then um, I use just a little bit of cider vinegar, just like a fourth a cup of cider vinegar, and then mm. diced jalapenos. Mm, the vinegar, that's different. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. now that when you... Remember, it's a, it's a jalapeno cornbread. Right. Yeah. Now, when you bake it, though, does it does it look like regular cornbread? Does it rise? Sometimes oh, yeah, yeah, it's so absolutely. flat. Besides the peppers, the peppers was something as an option. I just wanted something that was spicy because with this being a soul food book, you know, mm-hmm. once again, we've got to have that flavor in there. So I did a jalapeno cornbread where you can enjoy it with the greens and um, the, the red beans and rice, et cetera. So mm. that, that was the version of that. Cause, and when you did nutrition itself, uh, when you really look at it, you know, um, there's only one milligram of cholesterol because I used the skim milk in there. There's essentially no cholesterol from the egg white. Um, and, um, you know, it's only one gram of fat per serving, and it serves up six because you use about a nine by nine side bacon pan. Oh, man, that sounds good. Or you Four- can use like a 12 cup muffin, you know, muffin uh, pan. make them individually mm-hmm. muffin. 440 2665 or 1 800 940 2240. Give us a call and let us know your favorite soul food rest- uh, recipe. 440 2665 or 1 800 940 
800-242-4240. Is there a way to make fried chicken healthy? <laughs> Uh, well, an unfried chicken, and you need to recall like 10 years ago or so where everybody was doing it through the oven. They were putting, um, uh, what were the cereal on board, um, you know, the Kellogg crispy cereal, all that stuff. They mm-hmm. were using that for crunch, for texture. Um, you know, when you look at the process, when you're making fried chicken, you know exactly what's going on. But also, in, in all fairness, uh, one that cooks fried chicken really, really well, um, it is all about controlling the temperature of the oil. You know, obviously, if you're putting that chicken in the oil where the oil is not around 350, 375, it's going to absorb more of the fat uh, as that chicken oh, is Oh, I didn't fried, know that. Yeah. Say that oh, again. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the worst things to see is when you're trying to fry something and you don't see those bubbles once you put that piece of chicken in. You know it's just going to absorb that oil. And what people normally do when they don't see the bubbles, what they do, they turn the heat up on it and try to speed up the heat of the oil. Right. Uh, so 350, 375, you know, you will have less of the oil absorbing immediately into the chicken. But at the same time, when you cut into a breast and it's, you know, been fried 15 minutes or so at 350, um, you know, it's quite juicy. There's a combination of the chicken juice as well as some of the oil if you put it on a napkin and, and just kind of cut into it. Mm-hmm. Um, the oven is a route to go, but I, I, once again, I did a non-fried oven chicken in the book, um, you know, because this book needed to be extremely low fat at the time. Um, but I go back to moderation uh, where, you know, maybe a, you know, nice chicken breast and along with the rest of the meal or either two chicken wings and I'm talking about you know frying them up mm-hmm. but not sitting down trying to eat three pieces of chicken or either four <laughs> or five pieces of chicken throughout the day uh, which is so easy to do because when we're eating it is all emotional it's comfort you know one of the worst things sometimes to do is to be eating while you are watching TV or you're watching the, the football game or something during the holiday season because you're just going to eat all through the day you're feeling good and, and you want that feeling to continue to come or when you're around the family you eating all throughout the day or the holiday um, is try to structure that time where it's okay this is time to eat and then separate that happiness uh, throughout the day uh, mm-hmm. not so much around constantly eating because mm-hmm. we all get in trouble on that. Now when you <laughs> fry chicken do you do you put it in an egg batter or anything first or? or... I do a traditional fried chicken okay. that's traditional northern Mississippi way uh, it is not no a garlic powder it is not no seasoning salt it's not no onion seasoning all that stuff it is basically salt pepper um, you know, um, that is either in a paper bag or either in a container with flour. <laughs> yes. I do that. Shake you know, it, yes. I don't do all of the other stuff that added to it. And now, you know, you, you lose it when you're starting adding the garlic powder and all the other kind of flavors to it. You use the, lose the flavor of the chicken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so I don't um, add all of that on there. So, okay. so, it, so it's just salt and pepper and then whatever. Yeah, just salt and pepper. Okay. Just salt and pepper oh, and okay. flour. Now, That's in all it. fairness, I have to get a little Tabasco sauce or something afterwards. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. You uh, ain't so that first. You that You got that high increase in sodium, you know, with anything that's pickled, uh, particularly with the sauces and stuff, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. But I don't like the garlic powder and the seasoning salt and all of that because I really think it distracts away from the flavor of the chicken. And so you're saying that we can pretty much balance that out. If you're going to fry it, then don't put other fats or cook other dishes that have a lot of fat in them. To balance well, it out? That as well. Or don't eat as much. Or don't you know, eat as much. If you want to have a piece or two, that's it. Not eating three or four throughout the day. Uh, it definitely goes back to moderation and portion control. Okay. You know, and, and, and I'm sure any physician would say, unless your cholesterol is over the roof and you've got all kinds of other health issues, um, there's nothing wrong to having fried mm-hmm. chicken once or twice a month. And my producer wants to know, what kind of oil are you frying it in? I like the frying canola. Of course, peanut has a high smoke point, which means that it fries at a higher level uh, in terms of temperature. Uh, some people fry peanut, but I just do a straight canola. Um, you know, um, nowadays the price is equal to uh, vegetable oil. That was a price where canola was always, is always expensive, mm-hmm. but with supply and demand, you have more manufacturers that are manufacturing it. So when you see mixed vegetable oil, it's almost the same price as canola. Um, I don't do peanut a whole lot because of nieces and nephews and other people that are allergic to peanuts, uh, but that's also a very good frying oil as well. Okay. If you're just joining us, we're talking about cooking healthy soul food with my co-host, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby, and Chef Wilbert Jones, author, cookbook author, food product developer, and host of the PBS culinary series, Healthy Heritage Kitchen. Now, we're going to continue our conversation in just a moment, but let's go back to Pledge Central for an update on 
on how we're doing towards meeting our two thousand dollar goal. How are we doing, guys? We're doing very well. Just a li- there's a little bit, a scotial bit left there. If you want to get in on this dollar for dollar match, we've yes. raised uh, thirteen. Well, actually, thirteen ninety nine. So almost fourteen hundred dollars yes. on that uh, <laughs> Thank challenge you. there. Thank so you. there's a, a little bit left there. If you'd like to get in on this dollar for dollar match, we have this is our last day, the final hours of our fall membership drive. Seven five seven eight eight nine nine four seven six or whrv.org point click and pledge and you will be supporting this great programming i know you're all listening very intently right now about this uh, about how to cook with uh, what the best oil is to cook with for healthy eating but uh, if you stop for a moment and make that call you can support this programming i'm sandra woodward dan Colley is with me my my pledge partner hello i'm here and and, and you know ahead. what the show is tell me another view is healthy mind food <laughs> it's not just for your soul so i like hanging out with dan it's for your mind and you're not going to find this anywhere else and if you want to keep it on the air now's the time to call and support it 889-9476 or point click and contribute come on every dollar you give is worth another dollar with this challenge so call right now we need six hundred dollars more before this hour so we need at least two or three calls in this break alone so get on the phone 889-9476 barbara's working to thank you for that right there there's one come on we need at least two or three more barbara's in there working hard you know helping you stay healthy helping you stay smart every week get on the phone and say barbara thank you and i support this show 889-9476 and, and don't forget let us know about your pets let it, it's pet, it pledge, pet friday. pledge friday that's true pet that's pledge right. friday gotta feed your pets healthy too <laughs> we've heard from uh, nancy and david dickerson of virginia beach they called in support of this program and also in honor of their two kitties marvelous max and miss vivi marvelous thank max. you for your renewal they're renewing members thank you very much robert scott uh has uh contributed for yet another year he says he's a renewing member thank you robert from newport news and a brand new member to the WHRV family, Tom and Ann, I'm sorry, Tom Ellis and Ann Moore called in honor of Boots and Lindy Fig Newton. Thank you for that call. And four cats who have gone to heaven. They are brand new members. Thank you so much for joining the fold, joining the family and uh, pledging your support for programming here on WHRV. Another view would not be possible without members like you. If you're listening, if this is where you find yourself every Friday at noon listening to this show, I hope that you will join your friends and neighbors like you're hearing right there. uh, Like you've just heard the names I just read off right there and uh, support this program. We've got a little bit of dollar for dollar match money here that we can uh, help you out with if that's an added incentive. Pet Pledge Friday, that's an incentive. We're almost done with this pledge drive. There's another incentive right there to call in. 757-889-9476. Hey, Sandra and yes. Dan, can I interrupt for just Absolutely. a second? Dr. Keith Newby just made his pledge of support well, in the you, amount Doc. of $300. So Dr. we only have $300 you, to sir. go. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> and, and with the match, that's take two and you don't have to call in the morning. <laughs> you see, because the pledge drive And Thank you for that ping. I'll take that as a laugh. Thank you for that ping. <laughs> Barbara, uh, I would like you to say thank you to William Cole up in Yorktown. He called very specifically for this pledge and to support you and your show. Oh, right. thank Says you Says it right there in so the comments. Much. Support Barbara Hamley. That's that right. is so fabulous, and I so appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for you that very call. Much. Thank you for all the calls. We really appreciate and it. And they keep coming in because you know why everybody's calling right now? Because they don't want to miss another minute of what you're going to be talking about here in the second half of the show. 889-9476. Keep those calls coming in. 757-889-9476. A little bit of that challenge money left to make your money count double. Go twice as far. WHRV.org. If you're listening online right there, there's a little red button up in the right-hand corner that says support now, and that money will go right towards programming on WHRV like another view. And when you do that, that's when we hear that ping. So we have a ring, and we have a ping, and that means that you're supporting this show like Connie Top did from Tab in honor of her... Uh, one, all right, you got to help me out. All here. right, what am I looking at here? What is that? A, a Weimaraner. Wa- Weimaraner. Weimaraner. Is that a dog? Weimaraner. It is a dog. Weimaraner. Named Karma. I love that They're name. They're big gray dogs. By not being able to pronounce it, I probably have some bad karma coming, but thank you, Connie Top, for that pledge. And another renewing member, Margaret Anthony, for uh, her West Highland Terrier champion, Fenway, Triple Play, Angel, Channel, and in memory of Charlie. A lot going on there. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to be taking you back to what it is you're paying for, and that is great programming, great uh, shows like Another View here on WHRV. We've raised uh, about 1400 bucks so far towards that $2,000 challenge. A few uh, a few hundred dollars left on that challenge money. You can still get in on that by dialing 757-889-9476. It's Pet Pledge Friday, so you can call in on behalf of your pets. Your healthy peeves, mind food. Healthy mind food. Absolutely. Whatever works for you certainly works for us. Any amount works. There are unlimited memberships. Let us hear from you. 
1076 or whrv.org. Get that ping like you just heard right there. And thank you so much for your support. And we thank you also for your support here at Another View. We do have that $2,000 match, so your dollar will be matched dollar for dollar uh, if you call within this hour at uh, 889-9476. Now, we're going back to talking about cooking healthy soul food, and we really want you to join our conversation and let us know how you cook your healthy soul food. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-224. Four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation. We're just having a conversation. You're not required to pledge. So join us now, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. We're talking with Chef Wilbert Jones um, about how to cook healthy soul food. And Dr. Newby, you have a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, fried turkeys. What do you, ah. what, what, uh, yeah, that seems to be the uh, new wave thing these days. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, well, you remember uh, right before the pledge section uh, uh, segment, um, I had mentioned in terms of the kinds of oils. Uh, typically, and I want, I think I'm correct about this. Uh, most uh, people who are doing the fried turkeys, they're using the peanut oil, isn't it? Aren't they? That that's, that's sort of like the um, high um, smoke point. Uh, once again, getting that temperature at a certain you know, uh, uh, range, uh, 375, some in that ballpark, Mm -hmm. um, it is less oil that's absorbed during the cooking process as opposed to an oil with a lower lower smoke point or either not getting the temperature accurately so that the frying could actually take place immediately when the product is put into the oil. Um, When you look at it, um, again, you know, once the turkey is, um, you know, fried up um, and you start carving and cutting, um, you know, the telltale sign is if it's nice and juicy and moist, um, you know, if there's not oil rendering out a lot of it all over the place. If so, you know, looking at a way to pet it out. Um, I mean, there's just some dishes we're never, we're never going to give up. Um, uh, but you know, but you're not deep frying a turkey in the backyard every month. So mm-hmm. if it's just, you know, once or twice during the year, um, that's okay. Um, uh, but from the health nutrition standpoint, you know, it's, it's an, entree item you haven't but you've got all the side dishes you're enjoying as well and then you know of course portion control too okay macaroni and cheese now i know that you spoke with our producer lisa godley and she told you about her seven layer macaroni and cheese (laughs) or seven different kinds of cheeses wow exactly (laughs) but can you make healthy macaroni and cheese and if so give us an idea some healthy versions of it and let's just face it you know it goes back to a good traditional pound cake it goes back to uh, perhaps the way um, you know red beans and rice are cooked, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you when recipes are cooked in this traditional form, they're going to taste quite they're good. They're going to taste quite different when you're trying to do a healthy version of it. But the key is is try to get something that's acceptable. Um, a route to go is to look at some of the reduced fat cheeses. Now, what I mean by that, I mean still a good sharp cheddar cheese that's reduced fat. Um, and for the most part, um, um, if you use mozzarella, you know, in terms of mixing your seven cheeses, that's already kind of like a low-fat cheese because it's made with part skim milk. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, what I also say with that, if you're using a reduced-fat cheese, uh, one of the items you got to really watch, typically when manufacturers have stripped, um, for the most part, uh, fat out of a product uh, to get it low-fat, they also have increased the salt level, and a lot of dietitians mm-hmm. are very aware of that. So um, I'm saying figure out the way to taste it along the way before you add your eggs unless you're using some kind of pasteurized eggs or something where you don't have to worry about getting sick. Uh, but try to taste the product because uh, you might not need as much salt in it if you go to reduce uh, cheese root. Um, and, um, you know, maybe not doing a drastic version of it. If you know you're using seven cheeses uh, and each one of them is a cup, perhaps maybe try to skim it down and do like a half a cup version, you know, as opposed to a fourth a cup. Just kind of play with the recipe. Okay, so you don't get in trouble from playing with the recipe. 440-2665. Before you experiment on the family. <laughs> <laughs> or 1-800-940-2240. We're talking about cooking healthy soul food. And also, if you have any questions to ask the chef about how to prepare a, a particular dish, give us a call. 440-2665 or one 1- 800-940-2240. Keith? One of the questions I want to ask, and I always would like to throw this out to chefs, because I know uh, generally you guys are going to have certain dishes you like to prepare the most. For Just from your end, what 
kind of drives you say, okay, I love cooking this or I love cooking that. Is there any particular soul food recipe or, or dish that you say, I, I just love when I get my hands on this because I know I just do my thing and it's going to come out good Asian every time. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh, well, um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, you know, I like a really good sweet potato pie, um, oh. you know, uh, and I don't boil my sweet potatoes. I bake them in the oven. Um, oh. When you bake them, um, you're not, well, let's just look at the process. When you're boiling in sweet potatoes, what's really happening, you are losing some of the flavor, mm-hmm. obviously. But mm-hmm. when you're baking a sweet potato, that flavor is intact, you know, and the sweet and the caramelization is going on. Now, there's some things you do. You scrape your sweet potato. Um, perhaps maybe uh, coat them in just a little bit of oil um, to kind of sear them a little bit, or you can go the route and wrapping them in an aluminum foil while you're baking the process. That no, normally, when you do a baking potato in the oven, mm-hmm. uh, but I love baking in them in the oven, and then you're just going to execute your recipe throughout. And I think that when you're baking the sweet potatoes, it actually makes a better, it, it tastes better uh, than when you're boiling them on the stove. Hmm. Um, so okay. that is, uh, I'm sorry. I was mm-hmm. going to say, what's the rest of that recipe then? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> with that one, um, you know, um, depends on, and I'll also say this as well, depends on uh, the quality of the sweet potato, um, you know, it might be one with a whole lot of flavor. Maybe it would be one that's not so flavorful. Uh, I like to taste the sweet potato once it's coming out of the oven before I start adding my ingredients to it. Mm-hmm. And um, although, you know, I went to culinary school in Paris to learn how to cook, I'm really what you call a food product developer, food scientist. So I like to taste food along the way uh, and then, you know, uh, execute whatever else to make the dish the way I like. So when I cook in the kitchen, I'm not measuring everything. I cook like my grandmother cooked uh, when she was alive. I'm tasting, using all my five senses to make that dish. So I can adjust the cinnamon. I can adjust the nutmeg. If I don't want to use the nutmeg, I want the mace, which is the outside of the nut itself. I'll use some of that. Um, And then, you know, in terms of, um, you know, eggs, if I'm trying to do a healthy version, I'll go with the egg white substitute. But if I'm just, you know, just making it for the family and join, I'll just use traditional eggs. Um, I like also, you know, looking at not a whole lot of cream uh, because there's family members that are sort of lactose intolerant, but Mm -hmm. I, you know, might use in half and half, which is even more fatter than a regular milk, but at the same time, I'm delivering on the end of the kind of flavor I want. Or, again, if I'm making something healthy, I might use a little bit of buttermilk, uh, which, once again, the perception is is being fatty, but it's not a fatty milk, so I'll go that route. Mm -hmm. And can you tell the difference when you um, you bake something, whether you've used egg whites or whole egg? Is there a taste uh, well, difference? Um, you could fool people and not tell them what you're doing, um, <laughs> you know, because it's a whole lot of about perception, you know. Okay. Um, you can say, oh, this is mac and cheese I made. Um, you know, now, once again, you are talking one egg, you know, with that yolk is 225 milligrams of cholesterol. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love things that are fatty, taste good to our mouth, fat tastes good to the mouth, cholesterol, et cetera, you know, when you eat into it. Um, What you could try to balance out um, is that, you know, when you're doing that two-to-one ratio in terms of volume, um, is cooking along the process, you know, Mm -hmm. um, looking at the mac and cheese, you know, okay, well, do I need to cover anything? But typically when you do that two-to-one ratio, it kind of comes out about the same, um, you know, again, without that cholesterol being in place for the most part because you've got a lot of egg volume there, you know, Mm -hmm. um, if your recipe calls for three eggs, you got six egg whites, you know. So it, it, you know, and that protein will cook out and, you know, kind of firm it up a little bit as opposed to, you know, um, the um, uh, the egg, egg, egg yolk itself, which is the mm-hmm. cholesterol. Okay. But, for- but for the most part, I, I think it's always not telling what's going on. And even though you're in the kitchen making it and then let them try it and let them get addicted to it. And that's how, you know, we all remember back in the 70s, nobody wanted smoked turkey because it was so nasty. I mean, it tasted really bad because the way the manufacturers was, cook, was curing the meat. Uh, you know, 10 minutes in the pot and all the flavor boiled out and it just tasted like shoe leather. And then mm-hmm. they started perfecting the quality of smoked turkey. But, you know, in the early 80s, um, when they started perfecting it, a lot of household people were fooding their older family members, and the older family members really thought they were still eating smoked pork. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was like, I can't believe it. These greens taste this good. It's really smoked turkey. And so I always say, you know, play with it yourself. And once you've gotten it to a satisfactory level that you like, 
uh, is then, you know, uh, laid on the family members and the friends and tell them afterwards. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred. And that could be a fun thing to do. You know, <laughs> yes. on a holiday where you basically take one out of the fifteen dishes you're gonna make and just say, "This is the one that I'm gonna trick them on." All right, <laughs> we've got a call. Let's go to Randy in Portsmouth. Hi, Randy. You're on the air. Hey, enjoy your show. Got Thank a question you. for you on salmon cakes. When I when I fix them, I give most of them away, and everybody tells me, "Oh, I love these. I never had them since my grandmother died." And um, mm-hmm. I, I fry them in a very hot oil. Use a couple mm-hmm. of eggs, and I use canned red salmon. I fried it with fresh salmon. It didn't seem to stay. Um, mm-hmm. is fishy taste, and I was wondering if you had any ideas to uh, make it healthier and taste more fishy. Okay, Randy, thanks so uh, much for the call. Well, I like salmon cakes, too. We call them salmon patties. Um, and I, you know, um, it is totally different um, uh, when you make them fresh because you don't have that carryover taste uh, that you get from the can itself. Um, and, you know, also, too, you know, um, the way the process goes, you know, um, they, the bones are, you know, you can mix the bones in it, which you get the calcium in it. And I'm speaking of the can version, whereas, you know, the salmon that's fresh, you got to remove those bones because they're too sharp um, and, and so the whole process is completely different. Um, what to look out, look at is um, is perhaps maybe making a smaller portion. Um, so if you get from a can four, maybe you do a smaller version and maybe get six of them. Um, you know, um, to, to to have it to go around. Um, mm-hmm. You know, again, um, you know, if you want them healthy, or maybe one egg versus the two egg. Um, maybe looking at a reduced fat mayonnaise to go in. Some people add the mayonnaise in to add the flavor, um, you know, um, um, in terms of incorporating. Um, if you use some Worcestershire sauce, you know, maybe cut back on some of that being mm-hmm. loaded with sodium because the canned salmon has already got quite a bit of, you know, the salt in it in place to preserve it. Um, so portion control and then looking at your wet ingredients, um, maybe, you know, a little less egg uh, going that route. Um, and then also, too, you're saying you're using a very hot oil, so it's not absorbing a whole lot while you're cooking. Another option could be is not to fry them up at all. It's to, just to bake them out, um, spray them really mm. good. You know, panko breadcrumbs are very popular these days. Um, you know, Japanese-style breadcrumbs are what panko breadcrumbs is. You can, you mm-hmm. know, um, uh, put them in panko breadcrumbs and spray them with nonstick cooking spray and, and bake them in the oven. Okay. What about um, uh, apple cobbler or peach cobbler? The crust, because to me, that's the best part of it. <laughs> so is there, are there some secrets around yeah. the crust? It, 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 it. Right. It tastes good. Um, and and um, when I make cobbler, uh, the way we have learned how to do it through my grandmother, uh, and is basically we would do like a double-decker, basically, where in mm-hmm. the middle you also had some of the dough as well. Um, if I'm doing that healthy version, I'm not doing that dough on, in the middle version of it. Um, but the ingredients itself, you know, uh, vegetable shortening has been the way that many have gone for a long time. Uh, there are some um, uh, uh, buttered flavor vegetable shortenings uh, in the mm. marketplace. I won't plug any brands because I don't know if they're supporting your network. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, they're, they're, you could look perhaps maybe looking at some of those um, when you look at uh, some of those um, um, nutrition pieces. Um, those are, you know, a little healthier than butter uh, because you don't have the um, uh, cholesterol where some who want to use butter and not uh, the vegetable shortening. You can kind of, you know, go along with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if, if something called for a whole stick, uh, maybe use, um, you know, three-fourths of that stick uh, and then say, well, I'm going to add a little bit more cinnamon to it. I'm going to add a little bit more nutmeg into it to get that flavor because the worst thing to do is to go cold turkey and strip everything out mm-hmm. and then you know you're not going to really like it and then mm-hmm. you're going to go back to the original version, but you can cut back on some of it. Mm, that sounds great. So um, can you tell us, though, how to actually make that, that um, crust? In other words, what do you need um, to put in well, it? Well, at this, you're making a pie crust. A lot okay. of people make cobbler like you're making a pie crust for the most part. Um, you know, uh, you can do a Dutch style version. I find if you do it, you understand what the Dutch is, which is sort of like the apple where you're actually just crumbling it up and sprinkling it on top. Right. Uh, when you go that version versus just, you know, rolling it out like a pie dough and cutting it up in strips and then doing a lattice pattern. Um, mm-hmm. If you do a Dutch version, you can really control your portions, uh, how much you're going to do. You might make enough for a whole cobbler, but you could say, well, I'm only going to crumble it up and use half of this, and I'll freeze the other half 
or the topping for another cobbler, uh, where you're really getting something quite healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen people have even taken, you know, um, oatmeal and they've mixed oatmeal and not not cooked the oatmeal, right. um, but you know, mix it with cinnamon and stuff and sprinkle it on top. Some of them have added almonds on top and, and just try to get around to use other kinds of versions to make it a little bit more healthy because at the end of the day, we're looking for flavor and texture. And if neither one of those are not in place, we're not going to like it, and we will go back to what we're used to. Okay. Yeah, one, one question I want to ask, just uh, again, from my own curiosity, you, um, I guess, trained in uh, France in terms of your mm-hmm. uh, learning how to cook. Differences between how food is cooked there versus in the States. And I'm sure it's vastly different, but is it more, I mean, is, uh, is it more healthy, less healthy over there? What are the differences just in terms of style of cooking? Uh, well, one of the things that's becoming very popular in this country, particularly among restauranters, is that farm-to-table concept. Um, it's just taken off like wildfire here in America. Well, they never left the farm to restaurant concept, and they never left mm. the farm to family in terms of shopping for groceries. Uh, when I lived in Paris uh, in 1990, one of the things that I did remind me of home in Mississippi uh, was that, you know, those farmers markets were all over the city. Uh, you got a chance to know the guy, you know, that bought the first deal, and, you know, he was bringing some wild deal the next week. And so you had a real relationship with your vendors as opposed to just shopping straight to the store. Um, sometimes I teach workshops shops with senior citizens that have health challenges, and I say the ones that are still doing their shopping and cooking is even if you're in a big city, is still try to have a relationship with your favorite grocery store Mm -hmm. uh, to buy your meats and also your vegetables and see, you know, what they got coming in and so that you can bond with them uh, because there might be some things you really want and they're not caring, et cetera, Um, and and they might, you know, they might do things for you that because you're not asking, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a big difference is that... um, Particularly, and I wouldn't just say France, I'd say Europe, for the most part, they have a real relationship uh, with their suppliers. And I mean the consumer, not just restauranters, um, everyday people who are going to their markets buying stuff. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing. Uh, when I was in cooking school, um, I went to the Ritzy School for which is in the basement of the Ritz Hotel. Um, there was only 10 students, and there was a real relationship with mm. the instructor uh, where we would do theory in the morning, and then you went to execute recipes uh, in the kitchen. But we never could take recipes to the kitchen. You had to learn how to use your five senses. So the yeah. first two weeks was torture because you <laughs> got to remember what you've done and what you've learned. <laughs> and then, you know, you couldn't leave until you got it right. But nowadays, you know, cooking school, they can bring, you know, their notes in the kitchen, and this is totally different. And I remember telling my mother, I said, oh, I'm dropping out of this. This is too difficult. And she said, no, stick with it. She stick with it. She said, your grandmother, she was a cook for 41 years, and she she could read, but she never read a recipe. She used her five senses. And I said, ah, oh, uh, got it. This is what they're trying yeah. to teach you. They're trying to teach you how to use your five senses to cook. Absolutely. Now, I want to ask you very um, quickly about your famous spice applesauce cake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can you tell us about well, it and how like to cook it? It's like 20 years old almost. Yeah, okay. Well, it was one of the first recipes that when that book came out in 1996, the new Soul Food Cookbook, and also I'm going to send recipes uh, that we've talked about, particularly Great. that one, and I think a red beans and rice. I'm going to send those. Uh, to you so that you yes, we will put them on our, and, on and our or either email and get them. Fantastic. Um, I needed a recipe for one that when the book came out that would demo easily and when the book first came out I did the Food Network and at the Food Network they had a show called In Food Today that you got on the air and they did it live back then in mm-hmm. New York and so I needed something that could go well and, 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 and deliverable and then something could taste good because there were two hosts at the time Donna Hanover and David Rosengroff, I had to feed them on the air live. <laughs> so this particular recipe, uh, it's simple. Um, it requires an unsweetened applesauce, but you can basically find it anywhere. And unsweetened doesn't mean that it doesn't have sugar in it. It means that it doesn't have sugar added to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically flour and cinnamon um, and, um, and whatever the ingredients that I used here. Let's pull it up here. It's a very, very easy thing to pull together. Um uh, Let's see here. Um, You have some baking powder for leavening and then just a little bit of sugar. The recipe feeds up to 12 servings. Um, You're doing Mm. it, baking it into a 10-inch pan, uh, but you're only using a half a cup of sugar, but you're using two uh, cups of uh, um, uh, unsweetened applesauce. Mm -hmm. And then once again, with my egg ratio, I use six egg whites in there. And then you have your flour um, and then 
for the allspice for the season, and I use like two and a half teaspoons. Uh, one thing that I will say, uh, a lot of people who do cooking, particularly if they bake, they know uh, if you want to cut back on sugar, what you want to do is to play with the spices, meaning that you can increase the cinnamon in like a nutmeg or mace because it will enhance this whatever sweetness you have in your dish. Mm-hmm. So if something calls for a cup of sugar, you say, well, it's only asking for a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Maybe I'll use a whole teaspoon of cinnamon and then maybe, you know, three-fourths cups of sugar or something like that. You can play with that ratio because anything that got that spice behind in terms of flavor, it enhances the sweetness. And um, actually, that's just a little bit of vanilla extract and nonstick cooking spray. And it's a very easy recipe. You mix those ingredients up by hand or either with a blender and just bake it off. Okay. And, Keith, uh, yeah. we got about two minutes yeah, left. One, la- one, one last uh, question. question. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, artificial sweeteners, believe in it, don't believe in them, you use it at all in your cooking? Well, I mean, they always say, say tell the truth and shame the devil. I have to have coffee every morning. I do use Splenda. Uh, and before Splenda, I was using Equal. Uh, but the, it could be challenging to cook with some of them. And, and I'll go back to, um, you know, if you've got diabetes and issues with uh, sugar intake um, and you do want some sweet dessert kind of a thing, it's good that you would use that. But like dessert, you know, you may not need that slice of cake every day. That's, you know, you kind of go back and see what you're doing, what you're not doing. But I like them, you know, with my coffee. I don't like the, I don't bake with them. Okay. I have baked with mm-hmm. them, you know, to demo with, but yeah. I don't, I, I use a real sugar. Uh, I was very good friends with Julia Child, and I had a chance to go out to Santa Barbara to the last years of her life and actually cook in her place. I meet her. Now, this was not healthy. In my third cookbook, I talk about making smothered rabbit for her um, and roasted potatoes. And I remember all the way up to her death, she was just tearing that butter up at the table. <laughs> and she made it to like 91. And now uh, she said, some things you just, if you can, you know, if your diet allows it, you know, don't take back. But what she never did, she never snacked. And I would spend, you know, the whole day in Santa Barbara with her. And I'm like, you know, I want something to snack on. But she was so structured in her meals. It was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So there was wow. no snack in between. And, no, and that's how she kept her weight, too. Uh, Chef, I'm so yeah, sorry. we probably have probably longevity to some extent. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to run because we're just about out of time, but we really appreciate you and thank you so much for spending Great. time with us. We will have the recipes on our website, anotherviewradio.org, and we'll be right back. A little bit of humor from our audio guy, Victor Bowen. Oh, I have such fabulous news. We met the challenge and surpassed the challenge. $2,516. Thank you so much, Another View listeners. We are so very, very grateful. And I just want to take this time to just say personally, from my bottom of my heart, thank you so much for supporting Another View because, you know, all the money that we raise goes into a big pot, and but the bosses pay attention to when you call in and actually support a show. So this means a lot to us. So thank you very, very much. And it's not too late to call 889-9476 and tell the volunteer that you just love another view. Next week, we're going to continue our examination of the issues facing veterans. This time, we'll talk about involuntary separation. What happens when the military says your service time is done, but you're not ready to leave? Our theme music is composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Kamaria Mason answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thanks so much for joining us. And again, it's not too late to call 889-9476 and make your pledge of support for Another View. We'll see you next Friday. Thanks for joining us.